Sunday when he comes back um, was Nifter last Shabbos, um, right before Sarbatavis, which it says even in Chazal, when we fast on the tenth of Tavis, it's not just because of the one specific thing that they surrounded the walls of Jerusalem, which was the beginning of the end, so to speak, <laughs> but also because there were three days of darkness that descended upon the world from the eighth of Tavis already onwards, when they translated the Chumash into what's called the Septuagint, the uh, King Ptolemy, one of the King Ptolemies at least, uh, got 70 elders in different rooms and forced them to translate these, the Chumash into, into in Greek. And, and a miracle occurred that they all got it right, exactly the same changes each one decided to make so that the going shouldn't misunderstand the, the Chumash. Hashem made a miracle, that should occur. But yet, in general, the fact that the going now feel like they can talk to us about the Chumash is a reason for fasting as well. And that's why three days of darkness descended because really that's, even though the Goyim feel like they were enlightened on that day, but the world became darkened on that day. Because for a Goy to feel like he understands Peshat and Chumash is a dark matter. Right? That we know what the, what the liberals do with all, any, any pus you could give them. So you have this reason to be fasting. You also have on the ninth of Tavis, Ezra Sofer was Nifrim. I hope to talk about him today as well, believe it. And then you have on the Sarabatavis the actual encampment of Nebuchadnezzar's army around Yerushalayim, which lasted, I think, three years. And then he finally capitulated and, and started the siege after the siege on the 17th of Tammuz, which ended up in the destruction of the temple on, on the 9th of Av. But that took a lot of time, and this is a long way off, but we still talk about the, de the destruction of the temple. So those three things happened and there were three days of darkness as well. And in a certain sense, I feel I experienced that to some extent, even though obviously nothing compared to what the national mourning was provoked on those three days that we mourn. But I think Hashem sends us little messages to uh, remind us, as it were. On, the, on Friday, which would have been the eighth of Tavis, in uh, a tragedy befell Telstone specifically, I think, although many, many other people were affected. Someone also was nifter suddenly at the end of davening Friday morning, a uh, sudden heart attack, um, who is extremely central to his telestone, but also many other people all around. He was an English-speaking gadol, who may also be called a gadol Dor, perhaps, but not as, in the same stature. Um, Rabbi Mordechai Friedlander is his name. Uh, very, very big Tamil Chacham, who I know many people in Telstone, he turned their lives around, he ran, he was, uh, ran a kolel in Nevei Tzion for many years, and changed tremendous numbers of lives, and made many people, and, and still to this day, people run their households based on his sage advice till this tragedy, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And there's also a kolel that he ran that they were questioning what would be today with that kolel. You know, a lot of things uh, sort of happen at the same time, as they say, when it rains, it pours. So that happened on Friday. Then I read on Motsi Shabbos about Rev Shapiro being nifter on Shabbos. And then on Sunday, we had our own reason nationally to mourn, not only in the history of Kal Yisrael, as we said, but even in our own day, we had the tragedy of the Pigua of the four soldiers dying, um, being run over by So we had three days in a row, to some extent, of tragedies as well, as, as if our hearts are not open, so therefore Shem has to open them and uh, help us to mourn in the cases where we don't properly mourn. So uh, someone once said that if we don't know how to mourn, which most of us don't, we should try to, what's called in, in Yiddish, chaparayim, to grab an opportunity. Whenever we happen to cry for some other reason, we stub our toe or some other thing closer to our family, Chashom occurs, and we find ourselves starting to cry, first of all, don't be embarrassed, which most men are embarrassed to cry. Someone once said that's why we dive with a talus, so that we can pull it over our heads and cry all we want, and no one has to see. But uh, be that as it may, we sometimes, whether we want to or not, find ourselves crying spontaneously, and it's not a bad thing. It actually says by the... Um, 
tira of a person that <coughs> the first three days are called Yumei Bechi, days of crying. And uh, obviously it means the people who have lost, but it also means that there is a known idea that a person shouldn't feel embarrassed to cry, and uh, men who do have a hang-up about it, I think, in general, should find the right time to cry, because it is an appropriate thing. That's why some people used to do tikkun chatzos at night. It was a tzaddik, I think the chassam sofer, one of the gedolim, who used to fill a cup with his tears. And uh, I think he eventually drank it or something, but it was uh, he cried enough to fill a whole cup eventually, you can imagine. So when a person does have another reason to cry, perhaps he should try to hop a rhyme in the same moment, harness those feelings, similarly to in last week's parsha when Yaakov Avinu met Yosef, and he said the Kriya Shema at the same time that he met his son, many of the Maral says, and I wrote about it last week in my Dvar Torah, that he was using those emotions to get closer to Hashem, because once he had the emotions of meeting his son after 22 years, and he thought he was dead, etc., etc., that he had tremendous upsurge of emotion, so Yosef cried, etc., but Yaakov said Kriya Shema to harness that that energy and that emotion to get closer to Hashem. So if you do find yourself crying for any reason, try to harness it a little bit, not to divert your attention from the real tragedy perhaps, but to harness it to add, add more meaning to it by crying also for the loss of the base of Migdash and for the loss of honor to Hashem in this world that we are experiencing at this time. So that's just a, a general idea. But um, this specific Rav, Rav Moshe Shapiro, I had a shaykhus. I was telling a story before that he actually helped me out in a very practical way when I first became from to know how to handle going back to my hometown. I knew that he had been a Rosh Yeshiva in my hometown of all places, Stanford, Connecticut. And when I heard he had been a Rosh Kola there, a Rosh Yeshiva there, I, I felt, you know, I had a reason to ask him a question. You know, what should I do when I get there? Does he know if there are kosher restaurants, etc.? And of course, I was very naive. I didn't realize what kind of a guttle I was talking to. That he didn't <laughs> embarrass me in any way. He just said, "I have no idea." I, like, he never went around to the restaurants in, ta in Stanford. But he said, "But if you want to know, ask a certain abreich." He knew the abreich that would be the right one to ask. So uh, he was very helpful in that sense, but. I think it was my first glimpse at his, his greatness that a person like that is, on a, is a living on another uh, sort of plane of reality where he could be in a place like I grew up and have no idea of anything other than what was happening in the yeshiva. But, of course, he knew the Abreif to talk to, which was also very helpful. So, that later on, when I was actually in Or Samad, and Rav Moshe Shapir was uh, the Rosh Kolel of the Kolel at the time, in Nor Sameach, and I heard about his greatness through others that I had contact with, and eventually I heard that he had this incredible shear that he used to give on Thursday nights. And uh, I started to go to the shear, even though it was in Hebrew, and my Hebrew was extremely bad at the time, and uh, isn't much better now, but a little bit better, and uh, it improved as I went to the shear every week. Every Thursday night I would try to go to the shear, and there were hundreds of people who went to the shear. It was just getting in the door was a, was a big effort, and finding a seat, and uh, making sure you weren't sitting in someone else's seat. And uh, I became a regular over a period of time, as I was single at the time, it was much easier. I lived in the yeshiva, so going Thursday nights wasn't hard, but even after I got married, I continued it Rosh Hashem, for a few years. So I had an opportunity over the years to, to glean different ideas that he presented, and uh, I think the most important idea was to look deeper into everything, which, of course, any God you, you, you deal with will, have, will impress you on that level. But uh, he was a tremendous Balmach Shava. He, uh, in, I think one of my other rabbin, when he heard I was going to that shear, he said, he has the power to, make, to talk about making an egg and make it sound glorified. Like he had this certain power of speech and he could make anything sound ennobled and, and beautiful and significant. And uh, the truth of the matter is, it wasn't like taking something that was trite and making it out of proportion uh, important, but really to show us that everything that Hashem created is important. And therefore everything we look at around us is like a window that we could use 
to come to a greater understanding of Hashem and a greater Amuna. And that's really what I wanted to talk about, the idea of Amuna. I found that to be a thread through which we could possibly see this idea of what he presented to the world that we could glean from and perhaps carry the torch after he's gone. I saw that Rabbi Edelstein from Panovich, who spoke about Rabbi Moshe Spiro in his shmuz this week, um, mentioned that he was also what's called a Mazaka es Arabi. Mazaka es Arabi means he always tries to help Klal Yisrael in, in, in whatever situation he was in. Of course, every Jew tries to do what he can do. But he gave untold, like, uh, numbers of shiurim, uh, I think. And it brings to mind Rev, Rev, Rev Vigner Miller, who used to give 40 shiurim a week to different groups. The, he also apparently gave many, many different shiurim all over Yerushalayim to many different groups on many different topics, including, of course, Kabbalah and so forth, but even on Mishnayos and so on and so forth. And this Thursday night year, which is much more famous, and got written up and so on and so forth. But he had he had his hand in almost everything. He he had a lot of other chassadim that he did, that of course, as a leader of Klal Yisrael would have, but many of them weren't known to everyone. But his point, Rev Edelstein's point, was when someone like that is gone, you have to try to fill the gap to, to help Klal Yisrael sort of fill that, what's missing, fill up what's missing, to re replenish what's missing. So, of course, we will never be able to replenish that Guttle, but we have to try each of us in whatever way we can. It says when Rav was Nifter, for example, ten of his Talmidim got together and they decided to each one would do a different great act of Z, of Ilmi uh, Neshama, of Zecher Neshama, to take on one particular trait. So out of ten Talmidim, ten different traits were carried on by each, like ten different torches were carried. So when he was alive, he carried this one great torch that was made up of many different branches, let's say. They have torches that are made up of many, many different branches that are twined together, create a big torch. And each one took one twig, as it were, and carried us his own torch, because we can't necessarily do everything that this Godel did, but we can take one thing and carry on. And in general, that is the idea of, Z of uh, Ilui Neshama, to try to do one thing that that person, or as many as we can, and it has inspired us to do, and therefore, even where he is in the Olama Emis, he's getting a lot of reward for that because he caused you to do that in an indirect way. So, Rabbi Edelstein spoke about that everyone should try to become a Mizakis Arabi. We should try to do things to help Klal Yisrael in whatever way we can. Now, obviously, it doesn't necessarily mean we should spend our whole day doing it, but it means in whatever way we think we can do even one one more person I could teach a week, or one more uh, gemach I could open, or whatever it is. I'm not saying what it is. It might be helping the yeshiva in some way, shape, or form. Right? The yeshiva is perhaps the greatest form of zikui rabi. Not only do we help people here who, over the years, have gone elsewhere, and then spread that, and the ripple effect is is there's untold amount of zchus that ends up in klal yisrael, but also through even things like this video, which hopefully will be seen by other people, and other things that we do, our newsletter, different things. The Shiva itself is supposed to be a, a, a tremendous platform for Zikri Rabi. And therefore, the more you help the Shiva, it's also a, a, an extension of that. So, I personally felt what I gained from Rev. Moshe Shapiro was this idea of Amuna. He, when his daughter was very, very sick, um, some say that's why he ended up in America to be to begin with, because he had to take her to America and, and all the different uh, medical things that had to be done. But I later, when I was actually in the yeshiva here and started going to a shearing, he was giving a, a series of shearing on the Yud Gimel Ikri, the 13 principles of faith. And it was all supposed to be his chus to help his daughter achieve a Rufu Shlame, which unfortunately she didn't, but obviously she gets a piece of for it anyways, wherever she is. And uh, and the Amuna that came out of those 13 principles of faith, which each one is a, is a, is a, a, a irreplaceable pillar in our, in our faith in Hashem, so that was my introduction to him. So I, I wouldn't necessarily say I know all of his opinions, etc., but one thing stands in my, out in my mind more than anything, and I thought this 
could relate to our Parsha as well. He once explained the idea of Avram Ivri. We find Avram referred to as Avram Ivri earlier in the Chumash. I spoke about it one way, give it to her a few months ago. And also, even in the, I think, one last week or the week before, um, when the, the butler of Paro was speaking to Paro about Yosef, he calls him an Ivri. He says he's a Nar, Evan, Ivri, and he meant it in a pejorative way because they looked down on the Jews in those days. But uh, the word Ivri is what related to the modern word Hebrew, and therefore is something that even today we carry out into our lives, this idea of being an Ivri. Even though we call ourselves officially Jews or Yehudim, but Ivri is also part of our, and even Yonah, Yonah Hanavi, when he was on the boat, and they finally figured out that the whole storm was because of him, and they were about to drown because of him, he had to admit, yes, uh, I'm an Ivri. So Ivri is a way that Jews used to identify themselves or be identified, and it's a strange kind of a name, Ivri. Where does it come from? So officially it comes from the fact that Avram, our forefather, who started this whole clan, he was from the other side of the river. That's the simple understanding of the word Ivri that he came from the other side of the river, the word for going over the river, even in English, the word over is the same word as the Hebrew word, over, to go over to the other side of the river, and therefore, even today, the other side of the river is called Averliarden, right? Averliarden. Or you talk about something being Averliyam, on the other side of the ocean. So it means on the other side. So officially it meant because he came from Babel, and he was now in the Middle East, in this part of the, of the world where it's on the other side of the river. You want to say where he's from? He's from the other side of the river. But as we know, for a real name to have an effect, it has to, has to do with the essence of a person. So the Chazal say it, it signifies something more significant. They say that in a sense, Avram entered a situation where he was on one side of belief in Hashem, and the whole world was on the other side of belief in Hashem. So not a physical river, but kind of the river of Amuna, if you will. So Avram became this kind of torchbearer of the, of the belief in Hashem, and therefore people talked, talked about him as being Avram and Ivri, that guy who's like the only, the loner, the loner who believes in Hashem. And eventually he wasn't a loner, he got many other converts in his day, as well as having his own family that he built up to become, and uh, we know that there was a, a large following of Avram, uh, even in his day. So it still became our title. Even in the days of Yosef, they still called us Ivri. So what was that all about? So Rav Moshe Shapira actually said something even more deeper, which is how it can affect each of us in our daily lives. He said we're always in a situation of being in our comfort zone, I'll call it. You know, today they call it in your comfort zone. And uh, my wife, you know, whoever has visited us has seen many things on our door. She puts on our door everything she finds interesting. And the people who walk in our hallway get caught by the door for maybe sometimes 15, 20 minutes reading everything on the door. One of the things she put on the door recently is, life starts at the end of your comfort zone. Which, if you think about it, is pretty deep. So, <laughs> Rev. Moshe Shapiro, my understanding, said a similar concept, but of course on a much deeper level. He said, we are always on the verge of finding something else out. It's like today they call it the frontier of medicine or the frontier of knowledge or the frontier of man or like a Star Trek to go where no man has ever gone before. And being a pioneer, the word you know, frontier and pioneer uh, kind of signify this idea which Americans are very used to. You know, The whole idea of Americans were always going out west and, and going to a new frontier. When they got finally to California, they had a problem. There was not much left to physically conquer, so they started breaking other frontiers, and today frontiers are in terms of science and technology and so on and so forth, but as Jews we know those are insignificant frontiers. The real frontiers are the spiritual frontiers, and therefore we've always respected people who went beyond their comfort zone, and they did for others, as we said with Rabbi Shapiro, he did many untold acts of chesed. Someone said they, they agreed to drive him around once, and then for hours he was driving to different people to give out tzedakah, to give out this, like a, like a, like a Siddish Rebbe. 
And that's how every great leader is. And uh, we respect them very much for all of that private chesed that they do. But it's always going to be on. It happened to the Vilna Gomi, only slept two hours a day, right? In half hour intervals, four half hour intervals. He went way beyond his comfort zone and he became the Vilna Gomi. And uh, we're constantly being challenged to go beyond our comfort zone, constantly being challenged to get up for davening, to, get, to go to davening, to, to daven right, and everything we did here in the yeshiva, to read everything correctly and to understand everything correctly. And I always try to challenge you to go out and to disseminate that. Pick someone in your community to go out and disseminate to you. So who am I? I can't teach. I, I can only learn. But that also, we were taught at a young age to even teach when you're not that advanced. That, that's something we should get used to. And uh, we'll have to do it when Mashiach comes because everyone's going to want to know Torah then. Can you imagine everyone in the world that you know coming to somebody that they know who knows Torah and asking them to teach them. So how many people are going to come to you and ask you to teach them? It actually once happened to me in the street. I was walking in Nachalot once and this kid comes up and asks me because he saw me with a hat whatever. And I'm sure it happened to everyone once in a while they ask you a question. Why does this happen? Why does that happen? Why do we do this? Why do we do that? So this is something going beyond our comfort zone. So this is why we're also called Ivri. We go beyond, to the other side, beyond where we are used to being. And he even said, which is a bit controversial perhaps, but it's something that we could think about, that that is the idea of a Zachar as opposed to an Akeva. That a Zachar is the idea of remembering and it's also the impetus to act. Like when you remember something, you go and you do it. Whereas he said Nekeva, which is the opposite of Zachar, it comes from the word Nekev, which means a hold. So his interpretation of that was that women tend to want everything to be in its place. It's like everything has a fixed place. It's like on those uh, trays, you know, where you have a little hole there for the cup, a little hole there for the plate, a little place there indented for the silverware, and that's how women like everything. They like everything in their place, right? Every man knows who's been chastised by his wife for not putting his stuff away or for being a slob or whatever they call it. But basically because we, we're not so good at putting everything in their place, right? And it doesn't mean you have a head to for me to do that, right? They say that the alto from Kelm used to teach his, his students to be very careful to keep a tidy room, etc. Right? It's a part of having an orderly mind is having an orderly room. But... The idea is that, that that's maybe a good thing to do, but we go beyond that. Again, we go well beyond the norm of our even knowledge. That's why every day we're trying to learn new things. I, I learned enough already. No. We revere the Talmud Chacham. Talmud Chacham means he's a Chacham, but he's also a Talmud. He never stops being a Talmud. So every time you ask a, a person who's a Talmud Chacham, have you learned enough? They say that uh, Rav Isser Zalman Meltzer once met someone and he said, uh, how, do you, how did you, what's your secret to steiging, right? Steiging means like trying with all of your koichas, with all of your energy to, to learn and to grow and to be better. And he was already like a, considered a gadol ador. And he's asking this other person, how should I do my steiging? As if he's a little bachar in yeshiva. Because for him, it never <coughs> stops. It never stops. We're always going beyond our comfort zone. And that especially in terms of knowledge. Instead, and, and also our maizim tovim, we're used to doing X, so try to add one more thing, not to necessarily add a hundred things at once. That that will only end up in failure. But to constantly be aware, like a, like it says, a Torah learning is compared to a person who owns a store. He knows all of his merchandise, right? You ask a guy who owns a store, so far you're selling how many items? A hundred. You have a hundred items in your store. You know them all and everything like that, which is part of learning, knowing what you have, knowing you're learning. But Going beyond, you ask him, is this, is this enough for you? No, I'm, I'm going to try to buy out my neighbor, break down the wall, buy more stuff, enlarge the store, go, go larger, right? Always to go beyond people in business that have no problem, right, through pursuit of money and glory, glory or whatever, to go beyond their comfort zone. So this idea of Avram Ivri, when you say I'm an Ivri or I speak Hebrew, Hebrew is Ivri. That is the idea that we should remind ourselves constantly of this, of this thing. Now I wanted to say that in this week's Parsha, we have a few examples of it. We don't have much time here, but I'll just say it. The kids are, perhaps, 
as they say, die I say a certain thing to you guys, you hopefully go out and do more research on it over Shabbos and think about it while you're going about your activities. We have uh, um, the Parsha, as I wrote about in this week's, uh, in my Devar Torah, in this week's newsletter, is a stuma. It's closed up, right? So Rashi speaks about that, gives two reasons why it should be a closed Parsha. One, because when Yaakov Avinu was Nifter, the Shibut started, some form of the servitude began, even a small, subtle amount made their hearts and their eyes close, as it were, like a person who feels like, ah, oh, I thought I was going to be able to get out of prison, as it were, and now I see I won't. So that, that was a de- big down for them. The other shot in Rashi is a whole different, whole different wavelength of, of shot. Rashi says later on in the Parsha, when Yaakov Inu gathers all of his family around, and by the way, he davened for that. He davened as Avram Avinu davened for old age, and he was answered with old age. And Yitzchak davened for Yisurim, and he was answered with Yisurim. Yaakov had davened that when a person's nifter, it shouldn't happen all of a sudden. They used to sneeze and die. So he said, that's not right. What person should give over to his family? That's the proper way to, to, be, to go out of this world, is to give over to... And that's what we see in this, in this Parsha, when he gathers everyone together, and he tells each person their avoda. This one, even though he told them it was considered rebuke, but he was basically showing them, this is who you are, and this is where you have to go. Because tochacha is from the word hochacha, which means a proof to show someone where to go, where his, his actions led in a bad way, but also where they can lead in a good way. Every person has a potential to go somewhere beyond where he is, as we said. With the Kochel said Hashem. One other fact, which he wasn't able to show them, what's called Achari Sayyamin. He says, I will tell you Achari Sayyamin, and that means the days of Mashiach. The Maral, if you want to look at it, points out both the beginning of the parsha and also there where it's mentioned again, why, how do we know that he was trying to reveal the days of Mashiach, which we're yearning for today, and it was taken away from him. Hashem, as it were, said no. And here we have an interesting point. Why did Hashem not let him reveal the end? He, he with his Das Torah, Yaakov, you know, had a tremendous Das Torah, you know, any Gadol today, multiplied by a million, and that was Yaakov's Das Torah. And his Das Torah told him he should reveal the gates, he should tell the people when Mashiach's coming will help a Jew to know, okay, just keep going, he's coming next year, he's coming next year, whatever. Hashem said, no, that's not the way. And actually, the Gemara in Pesachim, which I don't have time to read right now, the Gemara in Pesachim on Nunbav 56a has a beautiful rendition of this story of what happened there, that when he didn't tell them is because the Shekhinah left him. When Shekhinah left him, just as when Yosef was, was, was gone, the Shekhinah left him, he was, now he's afraid again. Why is the Shekhinah leaving me again? What happened? All of his children are there, so it can't be because any of his children are missing. So what happened? It must be one of the children has something wrong with them. So he said, who amongst you doesn't believe in Hashem properly that made the Shekhinah leave? He knew it wasn't him. And so why, is it, why did the Shekhinah go away? So what did they say to him? Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. And he said, ah, like we would say today, ah, Baruch Hashem, all my children are good. And he said, Baruch Shem Kavod Malchus Olam. That's why every day when we say Shema, we add to it, Baruch Shem Kavod Malchus Olam. Gemara says we say it quietly because Moshe Rabbeinu didn't say it, whatever. So this was the answer to somehow when Hashem said, no, I'm not going to let you reveal the end of days. Because again, in my opinion at least, the reason was knowing when the end is going to come to some extent diminishes our Muna. To know exactly when Hashem is going to come, I compared it to this morning I missed my bus and I had no idea why I should miss my bus. I came in the same time which is a few minutes late than it's supposed to come, but the bus driver always comes a few minutes late. And today I came those few minutes late. I'm sure everyone's had that, that wonderful feeling. And nobody was there. Was, and the one or two people were there. We must have missed the bus. I kept thinking for the next 20 minutes till the next bus came, why did Shem do this to me? And then I realized, because I'm giving a schmooze today, and that's why my topic is going to be today. Right? <laughs> that if you know when it's coming, it breeds complacency. Again, comfort zone. If you know what's coming, then you say, I have time, right? That's the same Chazal that say, do tshuva one day before you die. So Chazal say, you don't know what day you're going to die. As we saw these past few days that people died all of a sudden. So how are you supposed to do tshuva one day before you die? So it means you're supposed to do tshuva every day. That's the Chazal. But as if you're going to die tomorrow. That's why they say it in such a way. 
But that means that if we know when we're going to person new, we're going to die, they say, I won't do tshuva this year, I'll do tshuva next year when I'm going to die. I'll make sure to time it just right. But like I happened to be this morning, you can miscalculate. You're trying to wait till that last minute and do one extra thing and blah, 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 and you miss the bus. Wouldn't that be horrible if everyone missed the bus because they were they knew a Mashiach was supposed to come? So Shem says, I'm not telling you. Don't tell anyone. Another shot, which is part of the same shot. Sadik Ben Munaso Yichia. The, the Gomorrah says in Makos, this is the most important Yisod of the whole Torah. And Chabaku said, if even if you forget everything else, this is what you have to concentrate on. Emuna. Emuna is the pillar of everything. And that's why. I think Hashem said, you know, it'd be nice if they knew that, but the way a Jew lives if he doesn't know it is so much more important. That's why the real answer to what happened was Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. The real answer to not knowing when Mashiach is coming is saying, I don't care. Every day I want to declare the oneness of Hashem. Every day, even if he's not coming today, I see so much about Hashem in the world, but even if it's contradictory, <coughs> I have to declare it's all one. It's all from one God. It's all in one direction. Misleading to Mashiach. And, they, and the answer as well, Baruch Shem Kavod Malchus is to say, that brings a tremendous Kiddush Hashem when you see a person who believes in Hashem no matter what. Even in Siberia, all the stories we hear in the Holocaust and people who, under incredibly adverse uh, circumstances, believed in Hashem. A tremendous, tremendous uh, Kiddush Hashem. And unfortunately, today, for example, when we have so much from Hashem and we don't believe in Hashem the right way, it's a tremendous kill of Hashem. So this is where Hashem says, this is the last rung. Um, this is where you have to shtai. This is where you now have to go beyond Avram Ivri, go beyond your comfort zone in Amuna. Amuna is the last frontier. This is where we have to try in our own selves to improve our Amuna and also of the people around us. We know so many people who, even if they're believing Jews, we found out today that not everybody asks you, does everybody know the Yud Gimel Ikrim? You don't know the 13 principles of faith of the Rambam, the, the Briskarov said you don't get into Olam Haba. That's scary, right? That perhaps everyone does believe it just intuitively or without actually having learned it. But why take the chance? As Rabbi Moshe Shapiro said, let's, let's talk about it in depth, right? So maybe we should start a share over here. But the point being, that each person on their own should work on their muno <laughs> and also the people around them. Take a few people around you, your own family, just a little bit here, a little bit there, speak about a muno. Say even Rav Shach sometimes would sit for hours in the yeshiva and they realize he'd been thinking in a muno and things, of, and things to have to do with a muno. That's why it had such an incredible uh, effect on people. And the, and the, and the, 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 the Chavos Chaim as well. Chavos Chaim as well used to speak about Olam Haba. They said when you heard the Chavos Chaim speak about Olam Haba, you felt like he's speaking about like, oh, right there, the next room. Yeah, right there, it's right there. You felt it was right there, according to him. And that's how we should project, we should be able to project to people around us. Of course, we can't do it on their level. But on some level, we should try to shout, Shema Yisrael Hashem Alkeinu Hashem Echad, to evoke a Baruch Hashem Kavod Malchus from those around us. So, Mirat Hashem through the schus of this, I hope it's a schus for the Niftarim, and also for this Parsha, which is kind of a bridge into the Shibu of, of, of Egypt and the Gullus of Egypt, and to try to get ourselves out of this particular Gullus that we're in, which is a final Gullus, to, to work on our Amuna, to work on our helping others around us to be Mazaka the Rabbim, especially in the Indian of Amuna, and to hopefully bring the Shiak and Rabbi in.
کشیم شان و آیم ریم آیم ریم لفون نخوش شان و آیم ریم شیراب و آیلا مزه آیم ریم لفون نخوش شیراب و آیلا مزه شیرام Yeah.